Hi, my name is Hugo and this is Hugo's Desk. I just wanted to make a small intro to this video since it's about two hours long. What you're about to watch is a panel about mental health and well-being in the creative industry brought to you by Cave Academy with the support of the Visual Effects Society. The purpose of this panel was to open a discussion about the systematic problems we face in this industry. In my personal opinion, we spend a lot of time talking about breakdowns, award ceremonies, behind the scenes, technology advancements, but we rarely talk about the serious problems, including mental health in the industry. We all know this is a difficult topic and even more difficult to solve, which makes this discussion, in my opinion, really important. In this panel, we talk about a lot of topics. We talk about mental health, toxic environments in some companies, crunch time, management accountability, but we also share some of our personal experiences and talk about what can be done to solve these issues in a very positive way. Our industry is not that young anymore, and I, I feel this can't really be an excuse any longer. This discussion is only scratching the surface of these serious issues, but we do have to start somewhere. I'm committed to having an open forum in my community about these problems, and more videos will come in the future. In the meantime, I would like to thank Paul, Lauren, Robert, Melinda, Pat, and Jay for an honest and great discussion, and especially a very constructive and positive discussion. I would also like to thank Cave Academy for making this happen. Anyway, let's get on with the panel. Remember, you can find chapters below if you would like to jump to a specific topic of discussion. I hope you enjoy, and I'll see you very soon. Um, cool, okay. So I'll just do a quick intro, and then I'm going to pass the mic to Lauren, and I'll just jab in every now and then. Um, so thanks, everyone, for attending um, this session. Thanks to the VES again for sponsoring these sessions. And today the topic is uh, mental health and well-being. Uh, so we've got Hugo, Pat, Rob, Melinda, Lauren, who's going to be moderating, and Paul Melinda um, back to discuss the topic. And um, I'm going to hand over to Lauren now. And again, I would just kind of speak when I feel like I have something to say. <laughs> just the same with everyone. Um, yeah, obviously, I speak when you have something to say kind of thing. Cool. Well, thank you so much. And, you know, on behalf of uh, the panelists and what I can see is a 49 people, um, I hope we're going to have a really, really engaging conversation. A um, couple of things just to housekeeping to get out of the way. Um, we want to have a really open and frank conversation. And some of the questions that I'm going to bring up, they are intentionally disruptive because that's how we have a really, really engaging conversation. But the focus of this panel is to acknowledge the challenges, but also, um, you know, I'm gonna be also sort of co-challenging everybody to walk away from this panel with an action they themselves can take to either improve their own mental health uh, or to, uh, you know, act as an ally or supporter, you know, for somebody else. So. I'll get these housekeeping things out of the way. So I'm a uh, mental health first aider uh, qualified in the UK. What does that mean? I'm not a therapist. <laughs> what it means is I'm trained to uh, spot the signs of somebody that might be struggling. Um, I'm trained to support the business that I work for in taking, uh, uh, making choices that would support an environment of mental well health. Um, couple of terminology things for you. So we're going to talk about mental health in two ways. One is mental well health and two is mental ill health. And this is one of the ways that helps us destigmatize this idea of mental health. Um, if at any point anybody on the call um, when listening to anything that's brought up finds themselves triggered or feels unsafe, you can send a private message. And I think between Jay and I will try to keep an eye on the questions and, and also on the chats. And uh, what I would also say is just please do uh, be sensitive to everybody's individual privacy. And uh, many of us have heard many stories of, of people's struggles. Uh, just please uh, try to make sure that you don't use somebody's name if you're not talking about your own personal experience because we don't want to out anybody um, unintentionally. So I'm really looking forward to this. I think I'd like to kick off. Uh, I won't be a heavy moderation, but I'd like to kick off with uh, just everybody on the panel giving a quick introduction. And uh, I would like them to, uh, we'll start with you, Pat, to say one of the reasons why they're excited to engage in this conversation today. 
Uh, okay, uh, so yeah, my name is Pat Emery. For those of you who don't know, don't know me already, I've been working in the industry since about 2007. And the reason I was really excited to kind of come on board to this is that I've had my own personal experience with mental health in the industry. And because of the way it affected me, I want, I kind of wanted to share that. I kind of wanted to share my experiences with students and other people in the industry to let them know that it's okay and it's safe to come forward and actually talk about this. Uh, and also because of, because of my own experiences, I feel that I can help others that are maybe not ready or don't know how to come forward. So that for me is why I wanted to come on board with this panel. Thank you, Pat. That, that's no fantastic. Uh, Melinda. Hi, I'm Melinda. Uh, I study expression science and I actually, part of the reason I got into this is because I was really interested in mental health and affective disorders. And I personally, and also a lot of people close to me struggle with depression and I just want to normalize discussion around mental health. I feel like a lot of people don't talk about it enough and there's also a lot of uh, ignorance about it. So I want to make it people feel more safe to talk about it by talking about it myself and sharing my own stories. Thank you, Melinda. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, Hugo. Hi. Uh, so my name is Hugo, Hugo Guerra. No, my, no, don't mind my last name. No one can pronounce it though, usually. Uh, so I've been working in the industry for about 20 years, 21 now, uh, going to be 21 this year. Uh, and the reason I really want to be part of this panel is because I've experienced mental health uh, from a point of view of seeing it happen uh, in a lot of problems over the years and many companies that I've witnessed, many companies that I've known about, and also from my students um, and people that I know in this industry. It's a quite small industry, so a lot of people know each other. Uh, so I know a lot of stories, and and it always like really triggered me because um, it's such an important topic, and unfortunately, it's something that people don't usually want to talk about because I personally feel like a lot of times the industry spends a lot of time, which is great, a lot of time, you know, showing the the celebration of the industry, you know, the breakdowns, the fancy images, the fancy visual effects, the ceremonies, the awards and everything. But we never really talk about our problems many times. And the real reason I really want to be here and I, I, and I really want to thank Jay and the Visual Effects Society and Cave Academy for giving me this opportunity is because for, for a few years now, I've been trying to put together a panel like this. I've been trying to do this and I've reached out to a few companies. I've reached out to a few uh, vendors. I've reached out to a few people, but everyone is so afraid of talking about this. Um, and no one ever really want to discuss because they're very afraid of the companies finding out. They're very afraid of, um, of uh, a lot of problems that could happen. So that's why I'm here in behalf of all those people and all the people that have communicated with me. I really wanted to have this open discussion and, and I'm my I'm very hopeful you know I'm, I'm really hopeful maybe it's because I'm Portuguese I'm really hopeful that this could open up the door for us to have more discussions and we can see this more in more podcasts and more panels and more YouTube videos and more things around the world because it is definitely a serious problem that affects our industry so much and we never spend time talking about it so that's why thank you Hugo Rob Hi, I'm, um, yeah, I'm Rob Andrews. Um, I'm head of VFX at Goodbye Kansas for London. Um, I've been chipping away at the digital coal face for what, nearly 24 years now. Um, know a lot of people, and there's quite a few of them on this list on, on this participating tonight. Um, and I also, in my 24 years, have experienced my fair share of, I'd say, mental, as you put it, ill health and stuff, um, in quite a range of, you know, down to having kind of a breakdown and stuff as well due to workloads and what have you. And I've also seen a lot of friends suffer the same. And finding myself now as a HAD of a company and, and also on the VS board like Lauren here, um, I'm in a position to start making a change. And I've got friends, one of them who's precipitating tonight, who's moved into kind of therapy and counseling and, and coaching and stuff which is absolutely great and um, hoping that we can encourage people like being British, it's always stiff up a lip, don't, especially British and male, don't say anything, I'm fine, I'm fine until you blow up, um, which is not good anyway. And it's not good for the company, it's not good for them, it can not be good for your career as well, because it can stigmatize you with, with employees and stuff. Um, so I think the more 
everyone we, we bring it out and, and deal with educating both people and, and, and companies and, and stuff into how to deal with it, the better the industry will be. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Paul. Hi, I'm Paul Mellander. I'm an artist in film and games and anything I can get my hands on. I've uh, been a professional artist since the late 80s. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I, I'm interested in uh, being part of the panel and the topic at large because of my one, my, my own selfish reasons, which are um, uh, I've, um, I'm diagnosed with uh, clinical depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, but the, aside from the industry, that was a completely different issue. But coming into the industry with those and seeing um, how parts of the industry are crazy making and how to address that, how to teach around it, how to teach how to make a stand where necessary, um, different practices in the industry, uh, and how to spot these things and avoid them or against them, I think is extremely important. Um, including the training uh, in personal bravery, whatever that that may entail. Um, so that that's that's my interest in in uh, being here. Thank you, Paul, and I, I really uh, I applaud your candor, and I <laughs> I'm really pleased to have you on the panel today. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and Jay, is there anything you'd like to add? Um, no, I mean, I think you've all kind of. Um, summarize why this panel is taking place anyway I think you know a number of reasons why I wanted to kind of run this panel and a number of other panels like this before and after is you know basically what you've all summarized you know not a lot of people talk about this this is just as important as learning you know how to draw how to paint how to make things in 3d and how to comp so um, thanks for all taking part essentially I will say before we begin and yeah I'll I'll leave it over to you Lauren Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, was delighted to have the opportunity to, to moderate this. Um, I made the decision to uh, become certified as a, a mental health first aider after I, I lost a colleague that I worked with and I was devastated. Um, I myself as well, um, I actually have, a, I have bipolar disorder. And when I tell people that they, they seem surprised and Paul, you know, as, as somebody else who's, you know, kind of shared, uh, you know, a, a diagnosis, if you will. Uh, I can't, I'm, I'm, sorry. <laughs> okay. Let me ask you a question because I, in, in my case, I, I really feel, you know, I, I hear this a bit, but I don't feel it myself much shame in the description of it. No. It's, it's a state of affairs. It's like, uh, in fact, I, I, when, when I look at others, I'm like, we're all somewhat, if we're not currently, we will be broken in some ways, redirected and reshaped. And it's like, yeah. this is, you know, I, I got I got mine in a, a strange dose, but I don't really feel much shame around it. You know, I feel like, okay, got to keep proceeding. You know, yeah. this is the, this is new stuff. Let's keep going. You know? Yeah, I, I really appreciate you saying that because I think one of the things that we want to sort of tackle in this panel is this idea of shame. You know, uh, I would we need to get to a place where if somebody comes and says to you, you know, oh, I, I can't come into work today because I broke my leg, you would say, oh, no, I'm really sorry to hear that. What do you need? Uh, there's no shame involved with breaking a leg. What if somebody comes in to you and says, you know, um, I've just had a diagnosis of diabetes, so I need to make some reasonable adjustments to how I work. OK, great. How can I support you? But the perception of somebody coming in and saying I have mental health challenge I've, I've been diagnosed with something and I need some support we bring in with us a great deal of shame sometimes to that conversation and quite often there's a perceived reaction um, mm -hmm. but in, in my experience you know let's just look at the statistics one in four people every year will experience in the UK some form of mental ill health and that statistic was gathered by MIND. It should be said in 2019, perhaps the statistics for 2020 and 2021 may be a little bit different, um, but that shows you how normal it is. Um, certainly earlier on in my career, I labored under the impression that I had this horrific secret. And no matter how good I did at my job, I would be found out uh, for being somehow broken, somehow less than. And in my experience, when you actually start talking about it, people go, oh yeah, no, me too. 
<laughs> and mm. the more and more you talk about it, uh, you know, the, the easier it is, I think, to to destigmatize it. So we've, we're have we going to get stuck in with a couple of questions. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, Jay, we can either stop to take take questions off the panelists of feedback or, or we can be pretty flexible about it. So it's my first big question. And I open this to, to everybody is, you know, how do we think current conditions within visual effects as an industry, uh, we can include tech and software development and, and also games. Um, how do we think current conditions contribute to mental ill health? And uh, who wants to go first? Mm -hmm. I'll jump in if you want. Okay, Paul, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think it, it's different per industry in the, you know, in VFX and games is where studio environments I, I'm familiar with. Um, and I, I think that for games, it's one thing there. I think there's actual um, psychological warfare employed. Um, there's actual tactics of, of gaming, uh, politics, um, uh, gaming in terms of like game theory and manipulation. Um, there's uh, uh, court, like Byzantine court hierarchies that there's lower classes and other middle classes and power structures along those lines, which are completely foreign to any endeavor or any career anyone's looking to be in in this industry. And it's crazy making. It's, it's, there's a lot of money to be had in games and in studios regarding bonuses and things along those lines. And that turns into a huge amount of intrigue and Machiavellian behavior by departments, by groups, by, and, and every game company I've worked at has had some level of this. Um, at the same time, there's also, um, you know, good support structures in there among the staff themselves, but not in the, the studios. The studios are very weak and self-interested in lawsuits, for example, or, or other litigation or culpability or reputation. Um, in, in film, I think one of the, the things I've run into is the um, in problems in decision-making, referred responsibility where it doesn't belong, um, uh, credit, uh, undermining uh, value, things along these lines, um, they are demeaning. And they're also, um, some of the timelines are impossible uh, and they're double binds. They, some of them are, you're striving for, they're indicated as valuable, but they aren't actually valuable and they disappear after weeks, months and whatever of um, being pressured and, and suffering under brow beating and micromanagement and credit deferrals and so on. So I think these things are not, they, they're crazy making. You can't go long, extended, exhausting time periods also being browbeaten and having the value of what you do for a living undermined. Basically, one of the things in which you tie your dignity dissolved by persistent peer pressure or other tactics. Yeah. And I, I, I kind of agree. That, oh, sorry, sorry Hugo. No, no, go. no. Go, go for it. I'll talk. That's fine. I'm just going to say there, Pete, Paul, that kind of hits the nail on the head for me, exactly what you're saying about the kind of people feeling devalued. And I think from my, my experience and experiences I've heard from a lot of um, younger artists, particularly, is when they when they get their first kind of go into whatever, whichever studio or, um, or part of the industry that they want to be in, that they don't really feel as though they're valued as a person and more as just, well, an asset. And in some cases, I've had experience where artists are even known as just that. They're not known as a person. They're known as an object. They become a cog. And yes, Make there's a whole overlying, this is a business and that we have to take into account that yes, businesses have to run. We have to consider, you know, businesses have to consider every, every kind of part of the value. But that doesn't mean that the artists have to be tr treated or shown or at least or given the, the given the kind of uh, the intimation that they are in fact not they are less than a person, and that sounds well, really extreme, but that's what I've heard. I've also experienced that. I mean, I remember showing up for the first time as an intern, and not 
and them simply going, oh, who are you? And right from the get go, I think that it makes you feel less than because you go, well, if they can't even, if they're not even going to have, uh, kind of prepare themselves for who is going to be starting at their company, how is that going to, how is that going to translate as you go through the rest of the company? How is that going to make you feel as a person? Um, so yeah, so a little bit of a waffle, but that, hopefully that makes sense. <laughs> if, if I can add to that, yeah. I, I've been in situations where I've been a director in companies mm -hmm. where I will actually have other directors or supervisors leads say, hey, don't tell so-and-so how good they are or they'll yeah. leave or they'll want a raise or things like that. They'll mm -hmm. they'll understand their position yeah, and or their value, which immediately makes, I have a spiteful streak and I go, hey, guess what? So, and so <laughs> everyone here thinks you're awesome. Yeah. If you want to yeah. go find other work, I'll help you. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that type of thing is, is it, it's real though. It's a mm -hmm. real thing to undermine and it's, it's not a small matter. Yeah. No. Yeah. So the, the, I, I completely agree with you, uh, with both of you, with Paul, Paul and, and Pat as well. And this is, this is a systematic problem that we have in this industry that is really not going away anytime soon until we do something about it. And especially what you were saying about people being flagged. I've witnessed that so many times in upper management meetings on companies where people would say, uh, we can push that person a bit more, you know, because he's still young. You know, we can like push yeah. him a few more weeks and, you know, he has like five or six years of life into him and then we can just get someone else. Like, and I, I saw this happening and it's just so disturbing. And this is like, I'll, I'll, I'll talk from a personal point of view. And I must say, before I even say anything, all the views and my opinions are from my own opinions, not you know, not from Cave Academy or Visual Effects Society. So I, I, just before I say anything controversial, I want to make sure I, I put that out there. I'm not going to flag anyone, but I'm just going to say that before I even start. I've seen that happen many times, and that is one of the reasons why I personally left multiple companies, multiple, you know, not just one, but like multiple companies where I couldn't stand this thing. I tried to bring this up to upper management, and upper management sometimes would answer me in several ways, either laughing at me, saying, ah, it's fine, they can handle it, or they would just say, no, no, we can't talk about that, That's we need to deliver this. So I've always been treated with the utmost disrespect whenever flagging this up with either having juniors experience this, mid-level experience, or even seniors experience these kind of problems, because it's just not welcome in these companies they only really think about the profits and the profitability of what they deal with which is fine because they're a company completely understand that but we also have rights as people that are working on these companies and it shouldn't really be like this we shouldn't be treated like assets we shouldn't be treated like commodities that you can just replace because we're not there yet we're gonna have robots but we're not there yet and i i feel like all these things, the demining, also the, the discrimination problems that happen, sexual harassment, all these things contribute for every year. I have a ton of students that give up, a, a ton of colleagues of mine that just give up and go somewhere else or go to another type of world. They start another career somewhere else. I ha and it's such a shame because these people were super talented they would have contributed to the industry so much. They would have contributed to moving forward this art and all this creativity that we that we try to do. And they have left forever and they promised that they will never come back because they were never supported. I don't have the answer how to fix this. Obviously, my personal take is that the only way to fix this is to flag it up as much as I can and to talk with with unions and to talk with upper management and to make as much noise as possible to try to change things. But I have witnessed a lot of companies that are not interested. They're just like, yeah, it's fine. Like, and it, it's 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 a real depressing way of doing this industry, which sometimes makes me think, man, I, I shouldn't do this anymore. I'm, I'm fed up of this. Mm -hmm. Like, why am I doing this? You know, what what's what am I gaining with this? You know. Hugo, I have a question, and for everyone else on the yeah. panel who, who kind of sees sees a similar point of view with this, um, I sometimes it isn't the company itself. Like the company is, it seems to be a there's a top tier major group, and then there's the internal mafia yeah. Yeah. or boys club or however it works yeah. out. 
And then there's the um, uh, plantation staff, you know, <laughs> which is, and I, I say that with a real, I mean that, I mean, they, the language referring to the staff in general is grouping, <laughs> demeaning yeah. them, they, you know, those people, that type of thing. Um, but I noticed that the internal, the middle mafia tends to, it, it isn't a, an organized part of the business. It in some ways works against all parties. You know, it, it, they're flim flamming the upper part on one hand and flim flamming the lower part on another. And it goes through cycles until finally it's found out and quietly they're let go with, <laughs> you, know, you know, when it's, it's, and I, I hate to say this and I've seen it more than once bordering on near criminality. You know, so I don't, I don't know if anyone else has run into this particular type of thing. I, but, I have, okay. I have. And, and to answer, like, you're absolutely right. I don't think there's an organization. Companies are not set up to do this in purpose. They don't. I think it's just because of their relaxation and their, they're not really checking. You know, they just let it be and let it go. And it, and it kind of gets controlled by that boys club, like you said. Um, I've experienced that as well, the boy, boy club, especially, especially in certain countries, I've seen that more than others. You know, like I, my experience in, in, in the UK has been very much like that, the boys club. And, but I've worked many years in Sweden and that was very different where upper management was much more diverse and much more mixed. And also like in, in Sweden, just, to put it out there, they have a much more um, a healthy relationship with work. You know, they go home at five and they take care of their kids and they have a much different approach. The whole society has a much more different approach to hard work and to working very late. And they, they most of the time don't do that. They are much more organized in that sense. Um, and I think it's because their society is driven so much to having family. Um, at least from my experience, I was there for three years and that's what I felt when I lived here in, in, there in Uppsala in Stockholm. Um, but I think other countries have really failed this. But the thing you're so talking about, Paul, how do you stop that? Because the problem with this is that those that white club or that, th that those people that are there, you know, those people that you said really would write, some of them have done criminal acts. They are staff, you know, they've been there forever. They have immense power. Some of them even have stock on the company. How do you even solve that? Because some of those, I've, I've experienced personally and friends of mine as well, where you can't talk about it because the person is too powerful. And so how do you even do it? I can be a bit aggressive and um, pushy in situations like that i have a real injustice issue um but i have failed every time and i i do notice that when i do try and like try to make major changes and push back against that oftentimes it falls back on the staff um yeah. there's more more that they have more tools at divisiveness and destruction than we do for trying to do something orderly organized and straightforward so a lot of times, one, one time I, there was a thing where I was doing some pushback against basically bullying, um, interdisciplinary bullying, set up all these things, you know, tactics, maneuvers, things of who's in a meeting, when, why, um, how information is channeled so it can't be snuck in and one person is overwhelmed. And the more I tried to stop it, it actually started increasing work hmm. because they that labors on the people who were trying to just get cleared to do their jobs. So it's very difficult to, you know, destruct, you know, the second law of thermodynamics chaos is way easier to than, than <laughs> organizing. Yeah. And the it's, I, I haven't, uh, and it's, I consider it a bit of a, a, not a bit of a failure. I consider it a failure um, that tactics I've tried, which they just utterly failed completely failed. In fact, I think they made it worse. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I, uh, I, go ahead, Rob. I just going to chip in. I mean, just, just from that five minutes, it's like, Oh my God, who would want to go work in VFX? <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I can assure you that in my 20 odd years, it's never been, it's not that there's elements of, of what's been said been going on, but on the whole, mm. it's not anywhere near as bad as that. And there's a lot of good. And a lot of it is down to, Dare I say, just humanity. It's just people being humans. And a big problem in VFX is a young industry. 
and we've seen these companies grow from like a few people to a thousand people and the people running it are the same people who run the small company but at no point have they ever had been trained or what have you in the, in the ways of running companies and so they're dealing with the things the best they can they don't know stuff and then the people underneath them inherit that lack of experience and knowledge as well they just people get in, into roles go from being artists to leaders to managers with none of the training none of the interpersonnel skills that are associated with it and everybody just keeps making the same mistakes over and over again and you do get in these companies you get personalities rising up and it is survival of the fittest you can have a, a very clever a, a brilliant artist who just keeps their head down and just works and does things all the time and then you can get somebody who's just very good at, at socializing down the pub and smarming and what have you and suddenly they're up floating up the ranks and stuff um, with no real skills and we've all seen that happen um, but then again that's kind of the the problems of lack of experience in management, dealing with those and, and, and promoting the right people and what have you. Um, and I think a lot of the problems that face in, in this terms of, of um, not being appreciating and, and communicating and all this sort of stuff, when we talk about how somebody's posted, somebody I work with, um, the whole review HR process, which devalues a lot of people. I've been there as well. It's just about training. It's like, you've just got to be honest about we're not giving pay rises so give separate pay reviews from your your own personal reviews and then you can you can conduct the personal review as I've, I've got some reviews to do you know in the next few weeks um as as it needs to be done and it's fine you can praise people and praise people you just go but just be honest and you've got to accept the fact that they might leave and it's the same thing with training in this country particularly vfx companies have been really really reticent to train people up and one of the excuses you hear was that I oh, will train them and they'll just leave. And it's like, well, that's not quite the point. That's complete self defeat because they might not leave. And even in the time they don't leave, they'll be better at doing their job, even if you gave them, if you give them the training. I think you made a really good point, Rob, which is there's a maturity level in the overall business that, that we have to compete with. And there's a propensity, certainly. And it's driven by necessity and by clients, by awards. It's, 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 it's motivated by a good thing, which is, businesses do well and then they they increase their headcount and largely the decisions are made with the best intentions and I think there can be a tendency to see it as a as a Machiavellian scheme and in some you know certainly I, I would never want to take anybody's lived experience away from them at all but certainly in in my experience there's a lot of people doing their very best and sometimes their best isn't appropriate for the role that they do for instance um I think I'd like to turn the conversation a little bit towards, you know, what kind of change do we think we need to see in order to promote an environment where mental well health is the norm instead of uh, a worryingly high propensity towards mental ill health? I think that uh, I think it's it's that lack of experience at the top and it has to be at the top. Change has to come from the top. You can you can have like we're getting a lot of graduates coming out and it's all being, which is great, but they're bringing, well, I wish I was taught at a university about mental health. That would have set me up well, but you know, way better. Um, that's great. And you, you know, these young people are coming in and and, and um, just, uh, you know, twenties and thirty, you know, hearing about it and it's in the news and stuff. But unless the people at the top, the people who control the purse strings and control the strategy of the company can be won over um, and instigate programs, instigate bringing in people. It's one of the things I'm trying to do at GBK is kind of bring in some more mental health. We've already had um, uh, a session with somebody arranged through Screen Alliance and Screen Alliance have been doing a lot of stuff with mental health and providing services yeah. and stuff for companies. And it's, it's coming in and dribs and drabs and it's, it's building momentum. And then we need that schism shift from management that's seeing the, but seeing the benefits. Um, to use a, a, an anecdote, um, my dear departed parents who, who died about eight years ago with the five weeks of each other, which is one of the things that Kind of triggered my ill health um, at the time. Their best friends ran uh, interpersonal communications um, consultancy, and they would consult the blue chips like, um, well, I won't mention that. Well, they're not connected with our industry, but BP, Halliburton, you name it, all these big companies. And the horror stories they would come in. So they would come in right at the top. They'd be invited in by CEOs and VPs and what have you to talk about things because they realised there were problems. There was one company um an american one where a vp invited them in the ceo didn't know them at all and the ceo just blew up like what are you doing here da, 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 da. and they said i could sit down and we'll just talk to you 
And then afterwards, it's like, oh, thank God you're here. Um, we really need you. And suddenly it was like opened up to the whole thing. And you get stories about um, there was a, a biotech company in Cambridge that they went to where the boss was a very, very clever biotech scientist and what have you, and become CEO of this company. And one of his rules was that while you're in the office, you could only talk about work, even at lunch. You weren't allowed to talk about personnel stuff. And obviously that impact on the staff was quite horrendous and that kind of stuff needed to be dealt with. So if that change comes in from the top and filters down and we hear about HR company, HR departments not really being about people, people, they just seem to be grinding you and down and kind of manipulating you and trying to get you to fit into the company. But if there's schism changes, you know, changes in there and stuff as well, then this whole thing will um, kind of this revolution in mental health and well-being stuff will come about more. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Melinda, we, uh, you know, I'm really interested as somebody who's representing uh, the tech industry. Uh, have you experienced or are you aware of any changes that businesses have been making uh, to promote mental well health? So coming, uh, just hearing a lot of this is so interesting because in, in big tech, um, there's a huge difference between how contracted versus full-time employees are treated. And so I, was in the position of being both of those. For the first two years, I was contract. And then the other two years and beyond, I was full-time employee. Contractors have limited sick days. They can't work from home. They have all these restrictions. And they're also put in a position of feeling disposable. And they're on a contract by contract basis. So if uh, they don't perform at a certain rate, then, hey, you're disposable on to the next one. And there's not as many good resources for uh, health or mental health. And everyone's feeling this constant pressure to be producing at a certain rate. No one wants to take a day off if they're, uh, even when they were physically ill, they would still come into work because they weren't allowed to work from home. And they only had a certain number of days they could take off for sickness. And the response would always be robotic, like, oh, you can use a vacation day. Um, but the full-time employees were treated much better. They were made to not feel disposable. They were given great access to uh, mental health resources, and that was constantly being promoted, and there would be talks. And a lot of my friends who were full-time employees, they did, or they were able to have, uh, like, they, there were certain tokens or allotted, I think, 21 or more days of mental health uh like you could see a therapist and they would cover that. And so those people were so much happier and didn't feel this. I mean, of course, they felt constant stress and pressure from um, just general work expectations, but their lives were so much better than the contractors which were, who were constantly struggling. So I feel like invest, what the big tech did for their full-time employees, they invested in them. What they didn't do for contractors, they did not invest in them because they wanted to kind of divide. It was sort of totally a class thing. Um, that's how it felt there. Um, so just investing more in your actual employees, providing resources for them and also educating them because if you ha just have the resources available, but people aren't personally aware of when they might even need to be using the resources or how to use the resources, then the resources won't do that much good. Okay, thanks, Melinda. I think the resources is a really interesting one because there is a, a, a large debate um, about whether or not it is, in fact, the business's responsibility to uh, protect the mental well health, if you will, of, of the people that work there. And one argument is that if businesses provide uh, what's often termed as OP, um, you know, a, an additional occupational health uh, provision for crew with um, employee access lines that perhaps take you through to, uh, to a call center, um, that this is sufficient in order to protect crew. I'm interested to know if anybody in the panel has experienced uh, useful resources that have been provided by a business they've worked for or has an idea of resources that would make a big difference to people uh, yeah i can i can chime in there for you lauren um i when i went through my own kind of issues that i had with mental health uh i had to take over about a year off actually from work altogether um but we can get i can answer more questions about that later if anybody in the you know wants to ask but what I found was that the studio I was working with at the time were fantastic. 
they were absolutely amazing. I couldn't have actually asked for any more support. Um, and that's something that I think, I mean, and they did that kind of without asking. All I did was I went to my manager at the time and I explained the situation and they gave me all the support I needed and were quite happy to just kind of, you know, um, just kind of help me through part, you know, my decisions that I made at the time. And then when I just, when I was ready to come back to work, what I was amazed to see and what made me feel, and it gave you that kind of sense of, great, something's changing. Um, when I was, when I actually went back to that studio, they had a whole panel set up to talk and support network to talk about mental health and for a lot to allow people within the company to come forward and just come along to this. And it was, it wasn't kept hush hush for the sake of people being ashamed or anything. It was just, it was more for everyone's own privacy. Yeah. They would keep the actual panel talk private and people would, people that were interested would ask, um, would contact their artist managers and say, where is this and what time is it at? And then they could go along and nobody, you know, so the company wide, nobody would go, oh, there's this, there's this big mental health talk where if you're struggling, please come along because they oh. know that there's a stigma. Um, not that there should be, I, I, you know, but it's one of those things. It's still a stigma that, you know, these days. Um, but it was a fantastic way to allow people to come along and actually, you know, and open up a little bit more about it. And it, what was amazing was the amount of people that showed up to this, this panel to talk about it. And it makes you go, and I think, part of this discussion is hopefully making other people in the industry as well as students realize that you're not the only, and it sounds, it's cliched as hell to say this, I know, but you're not the only person that's suffering from it. And you would be amazed at how many people are. And Rob, you one, you actually said, mentioned something earlier about, you know, mentioning it to students. And that's something that since my own experiences, I have decided to do because I believe that if you prepare people for, what could happen in the industry, then it gives them gives them the choice to make. Because that's the thing, you, we can't control the mental health of everybody. That's not what this yeah. is about. But it's basically arming people with the information that they need that when they are feeling low or they feel depressed or they're feeling under a lot of pressure, that they're, they feel safe enough to actually go and speak to someone about it. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that from my, from my experience, I, and that's, again, Rob, you mentioned as well, it's like, you know, <clears throat> oh, who would want to work in VFX? It sounds terrible. But for every negative point that you have, there's always going to be two or three great points. And like I said, I couldn't have asked for better support from when I went through, you know, and that's, and that will hopefully give people in the, you know, listening in, you know, a little bit of hope at the end of the tunnel that, you know, there is a lot of positivity out there and there's a lot of people that are wanting to help through this. But, but, but Pat, can, can I ask you something? Yeah. Like, um, of course. <clears throat> thank you so much for sharing that and thank you so much for letting... And you're absolutely right. We should all reach out and I'm so happy to hear that there are companies that are supporting you in that way because they, there should be more companies doing that kind of work. But can I just like mention one thing that I think I, I see when we're talking about this. We're talking a lot about how people should be prepared and how people should be prepared for, for issues that can happen on the companies and how they can protect themselves from mental health. But isn't the problem the industry itself? Because the problem I see is that we're pre it's almost like we are going to prepare them because we know there's a problem, so we need to prepare them for the problem. Why don't yeah. we fix the problem instead of having to prepare them? Because, yes, yeah. you are right. Many people have mental health issues, even if they were on other industries, obviously. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they would have yeah. those issues anyway somewhere else. But I see that the, the problem with this industry is that it's like literally broken, like the way that we handle deadlines, the way that we handle client feedback, the way we handle contracts, the way we yeah. handle the management, the way we handle the way that we, we have like all of these kind of military style Competi like like um, multiple uh, roles in multiple managements trying to it's almost like you're at the company and there's like five managers above you just to yeah. and then you know the client never really sees what you're doing so I feel that there's like significant problems that contribute to mental health and problems and well-being because the industry is not running uh, healthy it's not running yeah. properly we we shouldn't yeah. be working this way no one should be working this way. None of us should be working late nights. None of us should be no. responding to clients in feedback like like crazy man, just answering everything and 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 basically, f uh, uh, you know, uh, 
allowing them to just basically go all over you, you know? And I think yeah. that is the problem. I'm all I up totally for protecting. I'm all up for protecting people, but we need to fix the underlying problem, the beginning, you know? Well, I think, yeah. you know, I think, well, as long as we all live and work in a capitalist society, it's going to be a long and slow, <laughs> slow battle to sort out. I mean, yeah. I certainly think it is possible to change things, but that's going to be slow. And that in the immediate time, we need to be able to give the skills of people who are having problems mm -hmm. with all this, that the, the people that are having problems skills to deal with that and, and sort it out and try and nip it in the bud earlier. Like trying to, you know, getting scanned for cancer before it ever, you know, gets out of control. And then at the same time, we can tackle the cultures of work. I mean, I've got friends in architecture, and my God, you don't even know what's going on in that industry. That's just yeah, like, sure, but we can't compare industry. A, like, it's not a competition of how no, the industry I'm saying, goes. You know, I'm just, saying, I mean, it's just like feeling we're kind of neglecting <laughs> the fact that there's a problem, and we're almost like, okay, well, we can't do anything about it. Yes, we can. We can. Yeah, we can. The companies are working okay. towards it. You know, I'm HOD of a VFX of a company. And um, I'm actively, you know, sponsoring, you know, working towards, you know, it's a small company and we have a Swedish office, which is very different to how we work in London. Um, but it's not about so much about mental health. It's about the working environment. It's about trying to remove bullying um, and taking the pressure and making, you know, production more aware of the ramifications of just slipping things around in, a, in, in the shop gun or ref track. Um, and all this sort of thing. And that takes time, that takes training and, and experience and stuff. And it takes people stepping out of the rat race of doing it and having a look and seeing how we can do it better and improve things as well. And there are a few people like um, talking with one of the participants who a friend of ours and who Lauren knows as well about um, coming in and offering a service to come into companies and just talk about the benefits of seeking help. Because um, going back to your question line, like I've worked with three companies where you kind of get a card going, if you've got you know uh, financial problems or da, da 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 or your plumbing's broken, call this number, and it's like if you've got mental health issues, call this number. And that's not great because most people won't know themselves if they've got issues or like oh, oh it's not me or I don't need to do that and do that. But if you have somebody who's experienced in, in counselling and coaching, come in and go look, you know the here's some you know, experiences of, of people that have gone through or you know, this, is, this is what it can offer you, this is the benefits it can offer you and inform people about how that can help them in their situations or know that it's there. That's going to be a lot more helpful, I think, and encouraging people to avoid the stigmatism. I mean, I've, I, when I see people in the office in, in the past and I've said, you know, they've said, oh, I'm not having problem, I've recommended counseling and stuff and they're like oh you know that's rubbish i don't need to do that what does that do for me blah, blah, blah. and so there's a stigmatism against it but if we can break down those stigmatisms we can help people because often mental health in the workplace can be caused for problems outside the workplace it's not just through what's happening at the office um and so you know if you want people to be you know fine in the in the workplace as well it's about helping treating them and that it doesn't mean that we necessarily because the company fork out for counseling every week for that person but at least we can get them access to it and make them knowledgeable of it and stuff as well yeah i, I, I think to hugo and, and and to rob's point uh, and to paul's you know there are very many problems in very many companies uh one approach we can take is to see it less as the company and more as a contingent of people working at that company um and, and i would say that the same approach can be useful for people on you know who are attending this panel hoping to take away some some advice and things that they they can do if you look at your own sphere of influence and you start the things that you can control slowly but surely that sphere of influence increases so that the number of things that you can have input on and the number of changes you can make at a business you know should I, I, slowly but surely start to increase paul i i think the, the there may be and i think this is exposing it there's there like any issue worth looking at it's incredibly complex because there's a lot of players and a lot of things going on. Like, for example, what Pat was mentioning, um, I've worked in companies where they do have things where if you, you know, if there's anything where you go, hey, I need time, I need this, they will, you know, in some cases, bend over backwards. And in a dissonant way, still also practice things that are hugely unhealthy <laughs> toward the staff. So it's like there's, I worry about a couple of things um, 
resigning ourselves to a slow victory and making the worst cause seem the better because of it. You know, like like the idea of um, this is how people are. People are various things and they change and especially under pressures or uh, uh, learning better, they change and you can learn quickly. And I think one of the things that, that studios, I, I don't think there's a fix, I think there's multiple fixes. Mm -hmm. I think knowledge is one of them, T not teaching the staffs, starting in school. I talk to students now quite a bit and they're taught to be subservient. They're taught to think low of their work. They're taught to accept critique, even when it's not critique, when it's actually bullying and vandalism and then proceed and bow their heads as they walk into a studio, not having any understanding of the value, the billions and billions of dollars worth of value they're bringing in um, so that's one part of it. The studios themselves getting caught where it's decision making around what the corporation is doing and what the folklore around how we actually make money, that rarely ever is a factual statement. It's corporate folklore. You know, it's like we make money by this, but it's not actually examined. Like um, there are practices that in the 1950s were found to be detrimental business practices that you can find right now. And people are saying, no, I've been in this business for 20 years. I know exactly how it works. And it's very destructive. So I think there needs to be reevaluation to Rob's point. This is a new industry. And even we, we have, we can't, even as a new industry, we can't be infants forever in any direction. And, you know, we do have to like using a, an adulthood model. Uh, pubescence is pretty, quick and revolutionary and it <laughs> turns over things daily and it's probably time in our in our pubescence here to start looking and going what are we doing horribly you know what is it we want to do are we wanting business interests to overcome like in vfx film games all of these things craftsmanship entertainment high quality things are also a huge part of this that's what the audience wants that's what we want when we're making things the businesses will get huge amounts of money from this, regardless of what data analytics and chasing after omens may tell them. You know, having a meetup together and go, how do we all, not bowing our heads to each other, but as a collaborative business, what's the best way we work together and understand each other's value? Yeah, like I, I, I definitely agree. I think the best businesses right now are recognizing they need to move out of that adolescence, right? Um, and some of the questions coming up at the moment are around this idea that there still exists a badge of honor, if you will, of mm -hmm. people saying, oh, well, I'm, you know, I've had this many burnouts or I've had that many burnouts and I'm still back and I'm still in it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, do we think that there is this sort of whilst we're an industry, well, we hope a group of people saying we'd like to improve uh, the mental well-being of people within our industry do we think that that badge of honor is something that would stop us from being successful i mean i, I think that badge is is going quite quickly <laughs> as i mean i've i've seen vfx suits but i know when i had a heart attack in dailies um who who kind of push themselves and kind of it's it's have seen the area in their ways in some respect, or well, some who just have been fighting it all along and have quit companies because and have gone off and stuff and trying to change it. And I think from my knowing my friends in the industry and seeing what's going on, there's a definite willingness and, and people above me as well to change everything. We've kind of grown up in a rush, you know, it's in the past 10, 15 years, we've all been heads down, kind of churning through it all. And we have all got burnt out and we are all kind of suffering and stuff and we're like oh this isn't the way to do it we, we can't be doing like this we've got to change and i think bad management in companies you know from what you know, hugo and paul are saying um is being routed out and changed and stuff as well unfortunately in some cases it seems we've got worse but um i think there are more businesses to choose from now yeah well. i think there's more there people sorry yeah. go ahead um, there's like your, yours is opening up in London and there's a whole bunch of the new come like the company I work for came to London. There's a whole bunch more options apart from the old guard that have, that have been here and more and more clients are turning to smaller companies because the cultures of these bigger companies has become a well-known thing and they don't want to work for 
send work to these companies. Um, so it's it is it's kind of that cause and effect thing. It's kind of like there has been this bad thing um, going on, and there's there's green shoots coming through and progress being made. Partly because you know people like us can bring it up and, and working actively towards it and day to day, you know, the, in our workplaces and stuff as well, and just other people embracing it and stuff as well. And I think um, just turning to the games industry is kind of like a decade or so ahead of us, and we saw you know the turn of the century kind of like the EA getting into lots of hot water with uh, the wives of programmers and all this sort of stuff and a big burnout culture there. And it was all kind of like, yeah, like we're going to make a game, we're going to make loads of money. And it all kind of, companies are failing and all that sort of stuff. And then that's, they've had a good rethink about themselves and, and it's matured much more. And now the companies are kind of much more interested, realize that the staff are the people that make the product. If you burn them out and treat them badly, um, that's, you know, that's going to you know, shit you in the foot. And I think in the, certainly in the smaller companies in VFX, that's the attitude as well. It's kind of like we are the artists, although they are the most, as some managers might say, the most expensive part of it, but they're, without them, you don't get the product. So we need to kind of invest in those people and make it good for those people. What advice would people on the panel give to a, a young artist coming up within uh, the business that sees a lot of these behaviors? that sees people who uh, you know, are sat at their desk until really late, are answering emails at silly o'clock in the morning, um, would you recommend to them, you know, you have no choice, this is how it is, or, or do you have some advice for them in terms of how they can you know, really actively protect their, their mental health? I, I, I personally feel like that, um, that um, people, if they are in that situation, as I have been on that situation many times and some of my friends as well, both in the games industry and the visual effects industry, um, I feel like people should always not, we've talked about this on the, on the panel, I think, when last panel I was with Paul, um, where people can also not be afraid of walking away from a situation, you know. Uh, sometimes we really want to work on a specific company because we love the company or we love the work of that company. But sometimes it's not good for you. Sometimes it could be that that company turns out to be a disappointment and maybe there's some issues there. And maybe it's good for people to also learn to walk away and maybe find another company because there are multiple companies out there. Uh, you know, a lot of them are amazing and other them, others are not that amazing. They have pretty bad work culture. I'm talking about worldwide, not just the UK, of course. Um, and walking away and making a better choice for yourself, for your own sanity and your own well-being is something that should always be above any specific project that you're planning to do. It's all real cool to work on a really cool, cool blockbuster, but if it's going to give you bad uh, health problems, you should always walk away and find another project because there's so many types of projects and you can always do so many things. You know, So people, I, I think, need to kind of have a different approach. I, I have colleagues of mine that have accepted really bad conditions because of a specific project or they've accepted a pay cut or they've accepted to lower... Uh, their position so that they could go into a project. And I really hope that we can leave that behind because I don't think it helps anyone. It's like a race to the bottom. And I, I, I hope people can kind of like start making choices where they're not afraid of, of leaving uh, just to, to get a better place, you know. I think that's great advice. I think also remember when, when you're interviewing with an employer, you are also interviewing them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and more and more yeah, that's becomes, right right that's right that's yeah, a really good it, point that's a really good point <laughs> becomes important you know go to your interview prepared ask about training and development programs ask about the studio's approach to overtime and i tell you what ask the studio's approach to overtime and carefully look at the face of the person <laughs> that you're interviewing with it's going to give us away every single time and honestly the best person will say there are some things within our control and some things that 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 we can't control but here's what we try to do that's an honest answer you know somebody that tells you over time isn't something that happens at our business is either working at a business that generates its own ip <laughs> and has a, has a very successful setup or uh you know maybe you want to look somewhere else i think you know back to rob's point as well we do have more choices these days yeah. uh, sometimes you have to learn some very hard lessons and you have to learn them the hard way but ultimately, 
the individuals have the control, right? You can step back and you can try to make choices where you put your own health first, yeah. which is very important. Now, they, interestingly, there are some businesses that I've seen recently during lockdown whose approach has really changed. They've noticed very high attrition. And one in particular has instigated a, a points-based well-being system um, and tried to have senior members in the team be involved. Uh, and it involves booking out lunches. Lunches are never allowed to be scheduled in. Uh, there is designated time for, you know, getting out and away from, from the office. And people are coached by senior members of the team if they send emails themselves after a certain time at night. And I think these are some of the really uh, serious steps that need to be taken if we are serious about making a change. Yeah. Uh, and there's specific to our in industry, but also there's a lot to learn from other industries that are a bit more ch mature you know, yeah. and have gone through similar things. I mean, yeah. I, would, I would have to kind of agree with um, kind of like Hugo, actually, just, I mean, in regards to something I always say to students when they ask me about, you know, and it's specifically students because I do a lot of teaching, I kind of sum it up with do what makes you happy because which I, I, it sounds like an oversimplification, but like what Hugo was saying about, you know, if you don't like, if you know, you might want to work for a particular company that's like, that's your dream job. But if you get in the door and the, the team isn't great, the dynamic's not great, and you're starting to feel miserable, then why are you doing what you're doing? We get into this industry because we have a passion for creativity. And we have a passion for, for just for, for artistry. And if that's taken away because of the, the the experience we're having then you have to move on and that's really easy for people of our experience to say because we've been there we've done it we've got x amount of years under our belt for students it's a bit of a harder thing to swallow because they, they, there's this mindset and this is something that really needs to change is that there's this mindset that they have to do they have to do extra hours they've got to do all this extra work to become visible to become valued as a as an artist and if that's one of the things i feel that has to change in order to um to kind of make things better in the industry and to improve mental health overall because if you don't feel valued as a, as a person or as an artist this goes back to my point earlier but that that to me it's my my core point because it's when i was coming up through the industry in all the little small studios that i worked at that was the defining thing was you are not worth anything to us or you're only worth, you know, uh, Hugo, you mentioned, you know, that you know, they say with young artists, they've got to make four or five good years in them and then we'll just get somebody else. There's that, it's, you can work long hours. But yeah, so that's, that's the thing. Just do what keeps you the happiest up here and also what keeps you happiest there. That is the two things I would say. And if you're not happy, find something else. As hard as it might be, move on and find something that, that gives you your passion, that makes you happy and keeps you healthy. I think that's great advice, Pat. And you talked a little bit about knowing yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing what makes you happy. I think self-knowledge is one of the trickiest things. And know um, your value as well. Know, exactly. what know what you're worth. Yeah. It's really important. And there are now more and more um, external groups uh, mm -hmm. that will offer things like coaching, uh, somebody brought up in the chat that you can approach the NHS for mm -hmm. um, additional uh, therapy and uh, and support. And I think we would always recommend that if somebody is experiencing a mental health uh, challenge or mental ill health, that to seek professional advice is really, really important. Yeah. Um, and that should always be part of the way you respond. But um, Rob has sort of, you know, inadvertently or not just brought up a nice little addition to that which which is his dog <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things some businesses are doing is asking individuals what they need to feel more um more healthy mm -hmm. for some it's i want to bring my dog into work it really relaxes me this is a good thing for me um and, and what i like about businesses that ask those questions is they are recognizing that firstly they don't have all the answers secondly that somebody's mental well-being is yes to do with work but also is to do with everything they do outside of work and i'm really curious to hear from people that do we think that uh, this period of lockdown where many businesses have gone to an entirely work from home model 
has allowed people to have more control over an environment that they find is conducive to mental well health? Or do we think it has, uh, you know, potentially contributed to mental ill health? Uh, Melinda, why don't we start? Uh, I feel like it's a little bit of both uh, for me personally. Well, I was working full time in tech and then I was let go a few months into the pandemic. So then I switched to freelance. And when I switched to freelance, it was a yes and no situation. So much happier to feel like more freedom in my schedule and not have to be confined to a certain wake up at this time, uh, work until this time. I can't focus uh, consistently for hours at a time. So that was always a struggle for me. And I'd feel like I'd be sitting there not getting things done. But when I can work from home and freelance, I choose what days I, and what hours I'm working. If there's a day where I'm just not productive, I can allow myself to have a mental health day. It's not a big deal. I'll make up for it on a different day. And just like I understand how I work and that freedom has been really great. But also it's also been difficult to not have community and not be around people. It's so hard to have community from like a Zoom, a Zoom meeting or and just like lack of just the energy of being around people is really hard. I think if it were just uh, work from home for work and everything else were normal, then that would help a lot. It's kind of hard to know what, how to separate out um, other social functions versus just working from a computer. I feel like if everything else were back in motion, then this would be totally fine. And I would, I do prefer it, but I do miss people. So it's like a struggle of loneliness and isolation, but also freedom and flexibility is nice. So it's definitely been a challenge for me. There's a lot of adjusting going on. Yeah, I, I, thank you for sharing that. One of the questions uh, or statements that has come up is that for introverts, um, being in a work from home office is actually phenomenal. <laughs> and that it sort of democratized the, uh, the way people can act, you know, sort of behave within a work setting while you have a lot more control of your environment. Um, Hugo, what about, what's your experience been? Yeah, so my experience is slightly different from, I think, everyone else, because I was already working remotely for six, seven years before the pandemic. So I've been remote for a long, long time. And the decision, I'm not, I'm not introvert, you know, I'm pretty social, but the decision I made to stay home and to work from home was for, by necessity, you know, because after being burned out in multiple industry, in multiple companies, in games industry, in visual effects industry, um, I really had a lot of physical problems. You know, I had like, you know, optical nerve damage. I had like, you know, a lot of headaches. I had like uh, sciatica back problems. I really burned out quite heavily. So I made the decision, okay, I'm going to stay home because this is not going to work out for me. I'm going to die if I'm going to kill myself if I continue. Not to mention I'm morbidly obese as well. So I had a lot of problems because, you know, when you're working late at companies, you eat pizza and you eat burgers and you eat this and eat that and it just becomes a problem. Um, and so I'm, I'm much more healthy now and I'm, I'm at home. I, I'm, I see my wife much more. I, I, have my, I have two cats and one dog. I can see them a lot more as well. And I left these companies and I shifted to a pipeline of working home. I opened my own company. I've hired a few people, started pitching to projects. It was very difficult in the beginning because a lot of companies didn't want to touch me because I was working remotely. And uh, now, of course, it's not even a problem anymore because everyone is working remotely, so no, no one cares anymore. But it was a problem like in 2015. Um, so for me, from a mental uh, uh, health point of view, I feel so much more relaxed, but obviously this worked for me. I'm not saying that everyone should work from home. Of course not. You know, a lot of people don't like it. You know, a lot of people like to be much more social, but I feel personally that I've achieved a lot more now. I, I have a lot more time. I can uh, work at any hour I want. You know, I'm a night owl, so I usually work at night. You know, I, I really feel that I'm so much more productive because when I was in the company, especially when I was upper managed because I was a VFX soup at a lot of companies, I felt that I've, I've, I had a lot of time that was literally just meetings on top of meetings of meetings of meetings of meetings. And I, I felt that a lot of times I wasn't really working, you know, like I wanted. You know, I came into this industry to work, to do artistic things, not to just have meetings about the air conditioning or meetings about where the toilet should be located on a new building or whatever, you know. So it's it just feels to me that um, 
for a lot of people, working from home was really beneficial. Now, if I think about my students, and which I have hundreds of them, and they share a lot of stories with me, uh, for them, a lot of them, a lot of the people that are very introvert, they're really enjoying that, you know, working uh, remotely because they don't have to really like look up their shoulder and looking at people that are maybe looking at their screens or people that are constantly interrupting them, you know, uh, you know, producers coming in and other supervisors and always interrupting the flow of their job because it does take time for you to get your mindset into some kind of level of trying to be concentrated to work, you know. Obviously, I... I have been very fortunate to have a room that I can close the door because obviously working from home, if you're just on a kitchen, it's very difficult. And if you have a very small house, but I think also like I've, I've, I've talked with a lot of people now that are now thinking of getting bigger houses so they can have an office and they can have a bit more space. So it's been very beneficial for my well-being physically and also my mental well-being on not being so depressed, not being so so pissed off all the time, you know. It just just worked really well for me and it has worked really well for a lot of my artists on my company and also a lot of my students that I've seen their experiences. I've also seen of course the reverse of that of people really not enjoying being at home because they feel lonely and they feel like a bit depressed about the fact that they don't see anyone. And so there's another world there, of course, as well, which is very problematic as well. But that's my experience, of course, uh, Lauren. Yeah, I, just to quickly drop on that, uh, like Hugo, I actually started my career as a, as a freelancer. So I was completely used to kind of working from home for the first eight years of my career. I was just so when the pandemic hit and we all had to start working from home, I actually, um, in a strange way, the pandemic, I was very, very fortunate where it was actually my busiest freelance year I've ever had. It's actually because so many more companies have been more open to um, working remote. Like Hugo was saying, they're like, oh yeah, see, that's great. Everyone's doing it. So sure, okay, we'll, 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 we'll think about you now. And it's like, that's great because I don't have to kind of travel down and i can actually go yeah i can do this job and i can do it sitting here i'm all i'm 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 very fortunate that because i started my career as a freelancer over the years i've built myself an office where i can work from home and i know that that's not the case for everybody um but it has opened it opened up a lot more doors for me because it meant that i was i was getting more work during the pandemic and from a mental health perspective, that keeps you, you know, that's great. Cause you're like, this is great. I'm busy. I'm staying, I'm staying active. And for me, I mean, I actually, it, I find it very beneficial because it means I can, I can actually just go out and go out for a walk. Now I live in the country, so I have hills and, and forests and stuff and I can just go. And that for me is great. Cause I grew up in the country, so I'm not a big city person. I don't like the concrete jungles. I like trees. <laughs> so for me, very beneficial but again on the flip side there is one thing i find that could be a negative with it and that that it, that is that it's easy and very easy not to walk away from your desk the the, the ability in a, in a studio or an office is to go right that's five o'clock that's six o'clock i'm up and i'm out and i'm away back home when you're working from home it's very easy to say to yourself I'll just finish this off. It'll only take 40 minutes and then bang an hour and a half later and you're still working on something. So yeah. there's I think, that sorry, element. Sorry, Pat, no, 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 no. It's just, there's that. That's the only thing that for me I've found is a little bit negative because I have found myself getting into some bad habits where I go, no, I need to physically detach myself away from the desk and take the time away. Um, but for me, it's been overly quite positive working from yeah. home. because it's. I think it's yeah, it's interesting that you talk about that sort of tendency. I'll just do a little bit more. I'll just yeah. try a bit harder. Uh, one of the there have been some surveys recently, obviously run by different businesses, and one of the um, pieces of feedback that came actually from managers, supervisors, HODs was, "I've got to keep my team employed. Yeah, I, I have got to keep everybody in their role. It's my responsibility. I have to make it work." Um, you know, I'm aware of a, you know, a, a studio um, MD that I know who said, you know, I have 3,000 souls depending on me to make the right decision. Mm. Um, and personally, you know, that's the kind of person I want to work for. <laughs> the kind of person that, <laughs> that is thinking in terms of the kind of, you know, the, the people that, that mm. depend on them. But as an ex-MD myself, I will say the pressure of that is huge. 
mm. is absolutely huge. And so I wanted to swivel a little bit uh, to talk in terms of some people would be familiar with it, but the stress vulnerability model. And that's something that I think is particularly relevant for our business. This idea that there are lots of people who perform very, very well in high stress situations and also who have very, very strong resilience. Uh, you know, it falls a little into that badge of honor group. But that group also have a tendency to take on a lot of uh, responsibility for the, for the people that work with them. And I think that can be a lot to manage. And something that we see often um, is that those people are doing absolutely great for a long period of time until they're really not. And uh, I thought it might be useful for, for people in, you know, um, watching the panel as well to understand that Mental Health England have done some research into this to help people spot why that happens. Um, and, you know, we'll all have probably worked with people like this. You seemed like everything was amazing. Yeah. You know, you were thinking, how do they do it? How do they do it? And they're probably the people that say, oh, I canceled all my vacation this year. You know, I'm just hardcore, like play hard, work hard. And they're absolutely fantastic and then suddenly they're not and then suddenly yeah. that person has signed off from work for, for a long period of time and quite often people will ask that question of why didn't i see it yeah and that, that's and so, exactly that, that, that's so so good i don't want i don't want to spend too much time because i feel like i've a lot of people still have to talk as well but i wanted to say just really something really short lauren about that that's exactly what happened to me you know like i was i was known as the machine you know i was like known in the industry like Give something to you, go, you'll done it, you'll do it. Because sometimes I would work 40 hours in a row or I would work 24 hours in a row or would work 40 hours in a row without even thinking. You know, when I was 20-something, I would just work, work, work. I would be so fast and so quick at doing anything that, you know, the production and the companies were so happy. You know, they would just pour more and more shots at me. And after like 15 years, it really, really uh, uh, like was a huge weight on me suddenly like suddenly in one one single year everything went down you know I, I i only wanted to sleep i i was like you know i was having optical nerve damage i was like having headaches all the time i was like really not wanting to leave my my bed you know i i, I had so much flex time <laughs> at some point on some companies i have like i had like three months of flex time you know just to to understand how long it takes for you to work to get to three months of flex time and so I just took three months off uh, from from the companies, and I, I really broke down physically, not mentally. Fortunately, you know, I'm I've been fortunate on that side, but physically, I really broke down. I was really feeling bad, and unfortunately, Lauren, I have never recovered. You know, I feel like my concentration is now half of what it was before. I feel like I have much more headaches than I used to. My back hurts all the time, and my my. If I work too long, or if I even now, you know, we've been uh, going for an hour and a half. I'm starting to have blurry vision on one of my eyes because that happens when I'm too long on a computer now. And I know for a fact because I've talked a lot with my doctors. I did MRIs, I did like scans, I did all sorts of things. I know this happened because I worked too much, and I I was one of those persons that was working way too much, destroying my health when I was 20 and 30, and now I'm paying for it, and I will, I will never recover. My, you know, my optical nerve damage is gone forever. It's never going to come back. I'm always going to have forever blurry vision on one of my eyes. I probably will always have headaches. I will probably always like, feel very tired very quickly. My productivity is much lower now. And so you know, what I would say to everyone on this panel and everyone listening is be really careful because if you work too hard, it is going to come back and destroy you personally um in no matter how strong you are and how resilient you are and oh i'm gonna like work and it's gonna be fine i'm gonna just finish this project it's so dangerous and i i just wanted to share that with the panel because this that happened exactly what you said said there lauren happened to me uh, five years ago you know so Thank you can for I sharing that, quick, Hugo. That's really can, important for you. Can here. I just ask you mm -hmm. quickly, just to kind of Hugo, and I guess I've just been listening primarily, and obviously crunch keeps coming up a lot. Do you think you were taken advantage of, Hugo, by people? Yeah. Who should have been oh, yeah, them? absolutely. But I was a freelancer, so I had no rights, yeah. you know. So yeah. so the, the thing with this is that obviously it's too late now. I can't sue anyone about that. And it's not really directly provable that it's yeah. their fault or not. 
But I feel I was, yes, of course I was. You know, when I was 20 and 30, I was definitely taking advantage because I was known as the machine. I could do anything. And I also feel that my supervisors should have should have told me, like, Hugo, you need to go home. They never did. You know, and obviously I was maybe I had bad luck, you know, it could be. Unfortunately, maybe I was because I, you know, to to Rob's point, I know that some companies are amazing to that, and it's true. Some companies have protected their employees for sure, and I've been in, I, I've been very unlucky on that sense. But but I, I do feel I was um, uh, taken advantage for sure, and I, I know a lot of people that are taken advantage now. And because this happened to me, and because these are impossible to recover, you know, I will never be my old self ever, ever again. Uh, and I have friends of, of mine also that had strokes. I had friends of mine that had, uh, you know, paralyzed uh, on half of their face. You know, a lot of other people had similar problems that were are basically life-changing events, you know, where your physical um, uh, performance will never re re come back. My advice is really like for people to be very, very careful because it, it, it can really destroy your career. It hasn't destroyed my career. Obviously, I still work and I'm, I'm still working as a VFX soup and working as a compositor and working as an artist and a director in the industry. I just don't work as much. You know, I, I maybe do one project a year now. Uh, you know, maybe I do every six months. I, usually what I do is I do a project and then I stop. And then, and then I have like a lot of people asking me, oh, Hugo, you haven't done a lot of something a long time. Why, why don't you launch anything? I don't launch anything and I don't release anything that I've done because I'm not doing them. I'm only doing them very slowly, one at a time. I finish it. I never do two jobs at the same time. I do one job and then I finish that job and then I move on to the next job because I have to be careful. Uh, that's the, you know, that's the advice I got after the, after the scans I got and my doctor and the NHS, which is amazing as well. NHS is really like amazing in that sense. Um, so yeah, I, I don't want to bring down the panel. I'm sorry. I don't want to bring down well, the panel. I, I, I actually <laughs> agree with you. Yeah. Hugo, um, I exactly the same. I was crippled for a year. It almost killed yeah. me. Yeah. And, um, yeah. It's, you know, I, I think it is a thing that needs to be noted. It, it isn't just, you know, the physical and the mental things are super closely, they're not separate. You know, it's like you're doing damage. Um, there's, it's it's rough. You have to take, you know, you can't swallow back the, the pressures and just dive in. Like I, under stresses, I kind of love stresses, love, short deadlines and stuff are challenges because they're like a riddle um extended short challenges yeah, well, I, I, I used to love them as well you're absolutely i used to love no, that, 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 that escalating yeah. pressure yeah. and timetable though that will eat yeah. you. and you have to even though it's there may be even some pleasure in like hey i can meet this challenge um also don't you know you've got to keep an eye on that too because it, it will your body will not endure certain things i mean it's... i guess for i mean i i still don't like hearing everyone keep saying it's a new industry it's 40 years old now we're almost middle aged. <laughs> it's really it almost seems like an excuse that we keep making about yeah. stuff in general um but just again i've just been listening and it's come up about you know, getting people at the top to uh they're changing they're learning they're getting training which i find weird because you know just being nice in general seems like it's not too difficult but when it comes to, again, crunch and working people over time for a long period of time, what happens when you just say no? If an artist just says no, because you've spoke about walking away, but what happens if an artist just says no to a lead or a supervisor? Are they allowed um, to do that or would that be? I, I've done it. I've, I've done it. <laughs> and it's, sorry, it Paul, turns, I mean, there, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 you go, Paul, no. you go. There's a there's a deferral of responsibility. It's like the reason there's crunch at all in any of these industries is because somebody didn't didn't think something through at the front, yeah. <laughs> and it falls backward and, and dominoes down to whoever the most vulnerable is, and that's why they're crunching as opposed to the person in the decision making who has not actually made a decision. Um, that that's and I agree that's but that's I, I think that's an old tactic it's you know it's basically deferring responsibility yeah um, but, you, but I, you know what's worse Paul, you, you know back. you know what's worse Paul is that I feel guilty because I should have been the one walking away and but mm -hmm. in reality I shouldn't because I also should have been like managed better and I should have also been 
like with better advice as well. So obviously I feel guilty and I, but I also, it's my responsibility. It's my fault that I am on this situation. Um, mm -hmm. And the only thing I can do now is like to tell people not to do the same because it's an error. It's a mistake, you know? So just like you, Paul, like you're saying, like it, that's the only thing left for me is to tell everyone, like, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that. They don't listen usually. That's the thing, Paul. Like they never listen. Like they always say, hey, it's fine. I, I can do it. I'll just get a Red Bull. And that's what people usually answer me. Just they'll just ran, like drink a, mon a monster or a Red Bull or two Red Bulls. And, and they'll, because not, they're not thinking it through. They're not really, just like I didn't back then. I didn't fought. I thought it was bullshit and it wasn't ever going to happen to me, you know. But Pat, what were you? What were you? So, no, I was just you? just kind of so on <laughs> on Jay's, you know, uh, when Jay, when you were asking about, you know, what happens when you say no to, you know, a lead or a supervisor, it it, it just I got a bit of a, a flashback to when I actually I didn't say no as such. I I was told I was being asked to kind of you know finish off this particular asset for a particular show, and they said right, we need this by, you know wednesday evening right and i said to them i was like well i don't think that's possible within the time frame that we've got as in you know over the next two days this asset it's too complex it won't be done to the standard that we need it to be and the reply i got was that's the time we have and then the supervisor left the room and it's like now that is a good example in my opinion of that's poor management it's also it also kind of, I think that adds to people's pressure. I, that's unnecessary pressure because th that's not helpful to anyone. Rather than a discussion then starting about going, right, if you don't think that this is possible, is it because, and you know, and you hold your hand up and go, am I not good enough or quick enough to get this done? Now, not to blow my own trumpet, I know that I was quick enough to do the asset, but I knew from my own experience that that asset couldn't be done in that time frame. So what the supervisor, in my opinion, should have done at that point is go, right, well, we need to go back and see if we can re-budget or we can reorganize this so that it can be done so that we don't miss our deadline. To simply be told, well, that's the time you've got. That to me is an ultimatum and it puts you under pressure. And what did I do? I did the wrong thing. I well, stayed in until 11 and then one, two nights in a row to get the asset done. When I handed the asset in and spoke to the supervisor, do I get any response? No, you don't get a response. You don't get nothing. And that was that was only a couple of years ago. And that definitely constituted to my, not, not I wouldn't say the issues I had, but it definitely, frankly, pissed me off. Because to me, that's, that's not how you treat people. That's, you know, like you said, Jay, it's like, just treat people, like, you know, treat them like a person, really. It and also part of management at all yeah. or any type of thing to advocate for your teams mm -hmm. to advocate for your staff yeah and this is where you know and this is where i've run into that pushback it's like we're not going to do crunch if it's come yeah. to a thing where crunch is the issue we're mm -hmm. turning it right back and saying who does this land on who mm -hmm. was this who came up with this idea we need to have a talk we'll help you out we'll try to assist and get this endeavor done as far as we can but mm -hmm. we aren't going to suffer and that's it's an implication of demeaning yeah you know it's like well this this high better person said you have to do it and you're the sucker yeah and it's like <laughs> no, no, no if you can get no it done in time then you're clearly not good enough and we'll find and, and again and that puts pressure no, on. And, and you have to root that out i think one yeah. of the big actions i think for any manager or any production person on the call as well is uh, just because you're told to do something doesn't mean you shouldn't interrogate the request. Yeah. And I think more and more now you have people who are prepared to say, I excelled over eight hours yeah. and my work mm -hmm. is done. And tomorrow yeah. I'll come back and excel over eight hours. And what I do outside of work is one of the reasons I'm great at work. Yeah. But I have the right to say no to doing the overtime. I'm not going to do it. And ultimately, that's okay. You know, yeah. uh, a business a tries to give you recriminations for that. It's not a business that you want to work with. I have a follow-up question for you, Pat. After you achieved this thing that was extremely difficult, did yeah. you get praise, credit, bonuses, raises, promotions? What what followed after your high well, achievement? Nothing. But I don't expect, that's the thing. I mean, the thing is, I don't expect to get thanked for it. That's not what, you know, it's not about that really. But no. I have a question there though, but why not? I mean, you're doing good work. It's a thing that we should actually look yeah. at. 
we should expect to get praise and recognition and <coughs> pay commensurate to our contributions when yeah. we've done yeah. extraordinary contributions. Mm -hmm. It isn't something that you ha you've earned that. And altogether, you know, looking at it like looking and you go, wow, he did a fantastic job. Is he mm -hmm. going to be recognized for this? Yeah. You know, above and beyond. And there is a thing where I think we do go, well, I don't need recognition. I, I did that for a long time. And I'm like, wait a minute, I need recognition, mm -hmm. not because I need your confirmation. I need to know you understand the facts of what's happening on the ground. Yeah. You yeah. know, I need to know that you are aware of where value is sitting here, who's mm -hmm. contributing what and why, you know, so that's just I'm sorry about the rain. No, no. But to be <laughs> honest, you know, my there you go. My response there of, well, I don't expect to get recognition. That's because I've been in the industry for X amount of years. And that's just what I've come to be normal. And it's again, it's actually a really good thing to bring up because for everyone listening, this is what we're trying to change. We're trying to change. I mean, open up a dialogue so that you don't have to go, oh, well, I don't need to be recognized, be recognized for that. Yeah. Um, you know, and again, it comes back to me saying, to say earlier about you know know your value know your worth now obviously you're being paid to do a job so obviously there's partly your recognition there you're being paid to do the job so that comes as standard but that doesn't mean that you should just be uh someone's mentioned it in the chat you know you shouldn't be bullied into doing what you're you know you're paid to do a job that doesn't mean that you should say how high when someone tells you to jump right <laughs> you know there's a respect level there it's like you know you can, you know, it's a, a, you know, you do your job and you do what you're told within reason, as long as it's within the remit of your of your job, and you shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be bullied into doing the wrong thing. And that's something that it took me, a, it's take, took me years to learn that, folks. By the way, for everyone listening, it this that kind of stuff doesn't come to you immediately. Like Hugo said, you know, when you mention this to students, students, and I mean this in no disrespect to you, you are young you're not necessarily going to take that advice straight away. Sometimes you have to experience something uh, negative to make it, it go, oh, click, this is what people were telling me about. And then you can start making a change. That's why, again, I, I kind of push forward this. Let's give people as much information as, they can, as, as we can give them so that they can be aware of the warning signs and the red flags so that they can stop it before it gets bad. I'll... I'll stop talking. <laughs> oh, no, thanks, Pat. I mean, I think that suit is in definite need of some training. And I've known <laughs> lots of people like that. And I've known yeah. line producers and producers, even chords, who just come in and go, get it done, get it done. They're just mm -hmm. like, it's just because that's the culture that they've been growing up in and they've had no training. But yeah. there's also situations and there's a certain company at the moment who are deliberately underbidding and then getting the artists to try and do the same amount of work in those scheduled times, which is impossible. Yeah. And the culture of that company this is a company that before I started working there, I wanted to work for. And I described seeing people who work at this company as holding hands, tripping gaily through Soho, like as if they were going, you know, the land of milk and honey. Yeah. And now people are leaving them in droves because yeah. of the working conditions and they can't take it anymore. And even people higher up at that, that particular company are under a huge amount of pressure. Mm -hmm. and stress levels as well and this has all come from right at the top of the company mm -hmm. um and it's bad, but, but other companies as well like i actively in in my company like talk to the suits and talk to everybody about how to interact with people about not getting people although unfortunately over time and we and we give that in lieu as well we say if you're going to work you don't work overtime unless you get it approved and you get it back as holiday mm -hmm. um and we actively work and kind of to work away from it. And my big thing, and as part of the VES board as well, is to try and improve the industry so and make it more efficient and stuff that we're not resulting in this kind of train crash always at the end of projects. And I feel always feel sorry for comp because they're all the guys, they're yeah. always the ones that have yeah. to take, take up the slack. Um, in modeling, it's like, la, 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 la. and then comp is like, oh, and they go from project to project to project. And, um, and we need to kind of come away from that and change that. And that's what, it's part of my thing that I do at my company, and I'm, you know, this is why I wanted to kind of get involved with Vez as well. It's about trying to change that culture and trying to. There are better ways to do. It. I even suggested at my company that as a marketing play, we switch to a seven-hour working day, and they're like, we would never get the work done. And I go, no, we just need to rethink how we do it. Yeah. There was a case of um, a, a, a producer going to from London to I can't remember Vancouver or something, um, and in London they were just used to artists working all the time. Just work, 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 work. But in Vancouver, they were like, 
and that's six, I'm going. And they just all go up and left. And mm. so it's not going to work, it's not going to work. Within a few, like within a month or two, suddenly they'd rethought about how they did everything and it was started all working fine. Yeah. yeah, it's a really good point. Um, it's definitely worth quite a few businesses are now doing what they call core hours. And again, when you're interviewing, like dig into that stuff because it's going to tell you what the culture really yeah. is at, uh, at that business. And the Lou so hours, you know, we, as well, you were saying about asking the, the company on the interview, maybe ask about the vacation, the Lou hours and how does it exactly. work? Because I've been in a situation many times in a big company where I had to negotiate my extra hours where they would say, oh, but you know, you can probably just get five hours. And I would say like, well, I worked eight extra. No, but I'll give you four. I'll give you five, you know, because, you know, you were here, we gave you dinner and this and that. And so a lot mm -hmm. of times I was in a situation where I had to negotiate this. And so these things need to be strict. For me personally, it should be one to one. If you work an hour, yeah. it's an hour. But <laughs> many, kind, but many, com awesome. yeah, but many companies don't work that way. Many companies kind of like bring it down because they don't want to, they don't believe it's a one to one relationship relationship and um, so again going back to your point lauren ask this on the interview yeah. and say is it a one-to-one -one ratio like, like just so they can say can i have it on the contract and it say on the contract mm. that it that it is a one-to-one -one ratio you know being informed definitely i think makes you feel like you have more control and then you can also go back if that changes after the fact and say that's not what we discussed so we did mention it. We've been going for over an hour and a half, and I know some people will need to be getting away. Um, I know we could probably talk about this a lot more, and maybe this is just the first of, of more discussions on this. We want to go to a couple of questions that came up. One that was raised that's very interesting is uh, asking the panel, would you recommend uh, disclosing up front if you have a, uh, a, a mental health condition, or would you advise against it? Um, I, I would ask first, um, kind of, is it pertinent? Because I've had, mm -hmm. I've had staff come up and tell me about different things they, they're dealing with. And it's like, I, you know, when I will ask them, I'll say, is it, you know, is this something, are you asking for assistance with this or is this thing? They're like, no, it's just thought you should know. And I'm like, you do great. You know, this, this isn't affecting anything in, in the workplace here. If it comes up, you need time or whatnot. Great. You know, but um, on the whole, I think, I think it's contextual. If it's like a thing where it's like, Hey, I'm, I've got this thing and it's, it's coming up and it's like, all right, this is good. It's good for us to know so we can cover you and make sure everything's good for you and good for us and so on. Um, but I, I don't think like just as a, an open disclosure, I think you do have your privacy and unless it's affecting something that has to do with, with the workplace or some, some situation, I, I don't know that it needs to be broadcast. Um, yeah. I would recommend knowing your disability law in each location mm -hmm. that you work in. Um, it, it's easy to find. Google is your friend. Uh, and you can see exactly, uh, but in no region are you required to disclose a disability up front unless you are requesting what's termed reasonable adjustments. Mm -hmm. So reasonable adjustments would be if you needed to have minimal screen time. Um, for instance, these are just some examples, or if you needed a dictation app because you were taking a medication that impacted your concentration over a certain period of hours, you know, all of these things are well within your rights, but at any point, should you contact your HR team to disclose a medical condition, they have what's termed a duty of care to make reasonable adjustments. Okay, we'll take another question. Um, and there's, a, there's a, a, a suggestion, if you will, that we've, we've talked a lot about this idea that, um, you know, our, our advice in the panel has been very much for junior, uh, juniors and people starting out in the business. Uh, and, and I think that, that that's fair because I, I guess we're probably all, all looking at our experience and wanting to say we've learned the hard way <laughs> so you don't have to, uh, you know, we hope. But I, I would say that I think some of the actions that's been suggested here are something that could be used for somebody at any point in their career. Um, you know, does anybody have anything else they, they'd like to add? for more senior people in the business that, that might, you know, be hearing this advice and feeling like, well, what's, an, what's the advice for me? I, I, I think a lot of seniors would probably need this advice quite a lot. <laughs> 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 I think there's like, so, you know, 
Hugo's gone through and what's Paul and what I've gone through and stuff. And a lot of people are doing that in silence and they need the help and stuff. And a lot of people might not leave the industry if they had the help in the first place. You know, they go through all that. Thing. And quietly, you know, you don't get, it's not a badge of honor often. It's just that they're studious and they just work because they've just been good. And they're just trying to do the good thing. And, and eventually they do get to that point of breakdown and they, they need the help. It's, it's, it's important at all levels. Okay, thank you very much. I think in closing, it would be great to hear from each panel member uh, something that they feel is within their control to do to positively influence uh, both their own uh, after this panel. Who would like to go first? Oh, I'm sorry, Warren. I think you cut it off. It broke up. Yeah, it bro sorry, broke. Sorry, broke up. Oh, I was challenging everybody uh, in in the panel to you know end on a on a on a constructive and uh, action oriented note. You know, for one single thing they will try to do starting tomorrow uh, to impact their own mental well health or or somebody that they work with. Uh, take more breaks. <laughs> take more breaks um and to kind of elaborate on that the reason part of the reason this is something that we've briefly spoken about is that you know we're talking a lot about the industry having an effect on people's mental health but the other thing to remember is that external factors have a huge influence on it for example what happened when i went through my issues um which was mental exhaustion essentially physical and mental uh, breakdown um, it was a bunch of external factors as well as the pressure of the job. So it wasn't actually my job that caused me to need to take a break away. It was the fact that I hadn't actually, and I'm not kidding here, I hadn't taken a vacation for about 10 years. I just focused on work, 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 work the entire time. And I had that. And then essentially I had some, uh, some personal family issues that happened and that just made everything snap. So you, you would be amazed. You might think you're doing absolutely fine. You go, yeah, absolutely fine. Then one thing can be the catalyst. And that's what everything, that'll start you on a, a downward spiral. So that's something that at the time I went, right, that's it. I now know how I'm going to, I'm going to follow through with everything. And, and with lockdown, as I mentioned earlier, I found myself getting into some bad habits where I'm not taking as many breaks as I should be. So the one thing that I will be taking away from this is it's to take more breaks away run off into the into the hills into a waterfall into the glen very scottish i know but you know often we hunt for a haggis and then just come back and rest you know and take my you know take my mind away and my eyes away from the computer so that's my that's my biggest kind of uh, thing and i think you know it, as i said it's so easy now to just stay in front of your computer all the time get away find oh. something that pulls you away from it thanks pat uh hugo well, um, there are so many things, uh, really, but um, I think I think like Pat said, that's one of the most important ones. Um, I don't know. I think a lot of things have been already said. Uh, I personally like, you know, from my point of view, because I want to like flag this more and more into the industry uh, as much as I can, and I want to be part of as many as many panels as possible, and I want to like make uh, really blow the hornet on this like really try to talk as much as possible so we can get get some kind of constructive um, posi position um i'm gonna start having more of that on my uh, work as well you know as some of you know from the on the on the attendees i have a youtube channel uh, with uh, with a relatively big following and i'm i'm always focused on doing a lot of videos of tutorials and a lot of videos of a lot of cool things and breakdowns and this and that but lately, I've been hosting quite a lot of talks from the Cave Academy, from Jay. I've been uh, hosting quite a lot of podcasts. I'm going to be hosting this one as well. And I'm going to be, be like interviewing more people on this industry about this problem, um, you know, because I feel like we all, as seniors, of people that have been around for a long time, we should really like explore and uh, talk about our stories, talk about our problems and hear other people's problems so that we can kind of know that we're not alone and that there are other people suffering the same issues and other people suffering and going through the same problems. So I think sharing as many stories as possible, either on YouTube, on articles, on posts, social media, as much as you can, um, would be really like my goal for this year and for the next year. 
uh, so that we can kind of like open this discussion even more and doesn't finish here. Because a lot of times, whenever there's a problem, you know, even, we even we had that a few months ago where someone committed suicide because of all these issues uh, in this industry. Like we, we, you know, we do our likes and we do our retweets, but then we just let it go again. And then we talk about the breakdowns and the award ceremonies and all of that as well. I want this to continue. So I'm going to make an effort personally to post as much as possible, interview as much as possible so that we can start having this as a normal discussion. So where, so every month or every other month, someone talks about this um, because it's a major problem. Yeah. Uh, Melinda. So in addition to taking actual breaks, I think it's important for people and myself to remember to give yourself a break. So let yourself off the hook if you're not feeling as productive, if you're not uh, achieving what you want to achieve, just sometimes you need to let it's okay. You're not always going to be uh, on the same like steady flow. I, that's something that I've been dealing with during a lot more during the pandemic. There are sometimes like, a, I feel like almost a whole week or a little bit over a week where I just feel like I'm not producing or doing anything useful. But sometimes you just have to like allow yourself to rest and that's okay. And I feel like it took me so long to get to that point to just accept that about myself. And I feel like it would help, like we wouldn't feel as pressured to um, like stress ourselves out if we gave ourselves breaks and allowed ourselves to just, it's okay. It's not always gonna be what you want it to be, but give yourself that freedom and flexibility. Thanks, Melinda. Uh, Paul. Um, for myself, I don't really have any good answers. Um, I, I'm not really sure. Um, as far as um, doing other things, one of the things I like to try to do is speak to uh, young artists and seasoned artists and other folks and uh, not actually examine these parts, but build for five years from now, 10 years mm -hmm. from now where these things are hopefully extinct that we're talking about. You know, basically trying to train people to not dwell, look at these things or even take them as traditional, but look at best methods, how, you know, understand value, how do you interact with others in terms of value and how do you build the career and craft and things you want to with evading politics, evading these things and building a parallel value even if it's your own companies or a new paradigm. So one of the things I like to, to do in, in addressing this is saying, hey, this isn't, we don't have a, a, this is a false dichotomy saying either or. The world's open to us, especially now with new technologies opening up uh, abilities to work from home or work with people internationally. Um, these might be, we might be um, sore and infected from something old that might not actually be the continuing injury. So I, I kind of like to address it like that, like uh, let's let's aim at the future we want to live at. And the past has good lessons and cautionary tales. And it's important to know that uh, sometimes the world has hard edges, but also we have some things we have to invent and there are frontiers that, uh, that are hopeful that, that might not have these stinging aspects. So that, that's one way I'd like to address it. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. Uh, Rob? Um, for myself, uh, oh, I'm not sure. I just <laughs> kind of carry on fighting the fight, as it were, and um, try and make things better at uh, my company. And, and um, uh, like we've all been through, you know, a load through this um pandemic and stuff and I, I live on my own most of the time I've got my son here this weekend and I'm lucky my girlfriend's popping up as well um, but at times it gets to 6 30 in the evening and luckily for me I, well or unluckily because I'm management now I just have spreadsheets to go through so I'm like oh that's it I'm stopping but as soon as you do that you suddenly the room for me goes Foomph, and you're this little person in this huge empty room all alone and then suddenly it goes Foomph, back onto you and you feel like you're being crushed and fortunately, I think that's now that the evenings are longer and it's getting lighter in the evenings, it's kind of that sort of improving. But my own health has been suffering this winter. So it's kind of been it's for me to kind of just try and help myself and use the techniques I've learned in the past with therapy and stuff to make my days happier. Um, and then like industry wise, it's, you know, I've chatted to Lauren through Vez about 
trying to come up with. And, and a big thing for me is bullying in the industry. And bullying comes in many forms. It's And most of the time, it's this weird passive thing that nobody realizes they're doing and can be from their own, because of their personality type or through pressure on them. And it's educating people to avoid that and then just trying to stamp out old school, like horrible, misogynistic, sexist, whatever bullying that, that still pervades in, in some instances, um, and young people and old as well, um, and just try and educate that out of our industry, so which would help uh, mental health a lot, I think. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you, Rob. Um, I guess f for my part, I would remind everybody that it's your job, it's not your life. Um, and sometimes reminding yourself of that distinction is one of the, the healthiest things you can possibly do. Um, you'll have many jobs, be it one life. Uh, so focus on, uh, you know, uh, nourishing and supporting yourself as much as you can, because you're the person responsible for it and other people aren't necessarily going to do it for you. Um, uh, and on that, I would hand back to, to Jay. I've got nothing to hand over to. Um, <laughs> just say thank you to the, well, everyone on the panel again um, for joining for the session and and uh, obviously opening up. It's it's a uh, it's um, an important topic. I think I, I feel like we've just scratched the surface though. If I'm honest with you, that it feels like. Um, yeah, we have a lot of questions. A lot of questions that yeah, would be yeah. great to talk about as well. So yeah. I think I think you're gonna have to do a sequel. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I agree because I've got loads of questions of my own now, I think, as well. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for everyone who for attending. Thanks to the BES again for supporting these sessions and I'll see you, have a good evening. Yeah. Thanks everybody. Thanks, thanks everybody. Bye. See you later. Take care.